Good afternoon, I'm Kathy Hawks, Associate Dean for External Relations and Global Programs. Thank you so much for coming. I'm glad to see that many of you survived the DMD exam this morning. So uh, we are thrilled to kick off the iLead for this uh, session in partnership with the Health Systems Initiative Group. Thank you so much. And the iLead speaker series features amazing leaders that transform organizations, principled, innovative leaders who change the world. And today we have a shining example of that. There's three things you need to know. Uh, our alumni who are online, welcome. And if you have questions during the session, please enter them into the Zoom Q&A box and we will announce them for you out loud in the room here. For those of you in the room, there will be microphones passed around in the second half of our talk for Q&A, so be storing those questions as we go along. And the session is being recorded and will be shared uh, in the upcoming weeks. So with that, I will turn things over to Dean Dave to do the official Introduction of Steve Ruskowski, SM84, retired chairman, CEO, and president of Quest Diagnostic. Over to you, Dave. Thank you, Kathy. You pretty much just said it. Uh, yeah. um, well, I will say only a tiny bit more if I could. Um, uh, certainly, I do want to acknowledge that this is joint with the Health System Initiative for the MIT Sloan School, um, and I'm grateful for that. Uh, uh, some of you do already know that Steve stepped down as chairman of Quest Diagnostics in March, I think, of this year, um, having prior to that been president and CEO from 2012 to 2022. It was a transformative time for Quest, um, and as I'll ask him um, to describe and discuss in a minute, um, Steve came as an outsider to a a firm in some significant challenge at that time, um, offering a vision for focus and for impact um, to make the firm what the world would need and what um, the marketplace will support as well. And um, it was an extraordinary story, and I look forward to Steve telling you about it rather than me telling you about it. Um, prior to that, Steve was the CEO of uh, Philips Healthcare, and um, there are really good stories from that too, if we have time, but <laughs> we'll see how much time we have. Um, Steve also has um, a life outside of those um, uh, management responsibilities. Um, he's led in um, industry association. Um, he's served and serves uh, as a member of board of directors for a number of organizations. And, um, that, too, I think would provide us an interesting opportunity to talk about um, uh, maybe the more recent past for Steve and the path going forward to having a fulfilling, um, a fulfilling life as well as a successful managerial career. Um, Steve has a MEC degree from Worcester Polytechnic and is indeed a graduate of the MIT Sloan School of Management, and we are very proud to claim him. Um, he serves on the MIT Sloan School's um, Executive uh, Advisory Board. So in multiple respects, Steve is my boss, and uh, I'm glad for his uh, input and advice and support of the school. Steve has been a very supportive alum in multiple respects. Um, and so with that, um, Steve, um, let's turn to the first question. We've never sure. met each other. We have no idea where this is going to go, <laughs> perhaps. But you came to Quest as an outsider. Yes. And um, I'd like to ask you a little bit about what that felt like mm -hmm. and also from the standpoint of management and strategy, how you chose to deal with um, an organization that um, you didn't grow up in and didn't have a history in, right. but that needed significant change. I appreciate it. Well, first of all, thank you for having me. And can you hear me okay in the back? Okay, Trans it's transmitting okay. Sounds good. So pleasure to be with you today. And um, so, Dean, it was an interesting time. Um, so at the point I joined Quest Diagnostics, I was running Philips Healthcare, okay? And you know, Philips Healthcare is a large global portion of Philips Corporation and competes with GE and Siemens and every kind of equipment you could think of throughout the world. And I was based in Amsterdam. So you can imagine it's a global job, and it was really bicontinental. I had an office in Amsterdam and an office here in Andover, Massachusetts. So it was quite busy managing Philips Healthcare. And so I was recruited from the outside, okay? And um, at the point that I was recruited, 
uh, the company was, and the board of directors for the company was encouraged by shareholders to make a change. It's well, well known. And so they started to look outside. So when you're recruiting for getting recruited from the outside, you meet in all sorts of interesting venues. And it's typically off, off campus and it's off, off, um, off um, business hours. So I met in university clubs in New York City, I met in uh, uh, flight clubs at airports, you name it, and I've met through, through January and March. Um, but fortunately for me, I was offered the, the opportunity to join. And I joined on May 1st, 2012. And the interesting part of this, when I joined on May 1st of 2012, I knocked on the door of headquarters, of Quest Diagnostics headquarters, and I never set foot in any facility at Quest Diagnostics, nor did I talk to any member of management, including the CEO. Okay, So everything I learned about the company is what you can read. Everything I learned about the company is from the board. Clearly I had a perspective, but I had to join a company that you know, I needed you know, to come in and make change. So when I knocked on the door, uh, I met my first employee. It was my admin assistant. And they, she immediately mic'd me up, and I went downstairs for a town hall meeting. Okay? And I was the new CEO for Quest Diagnostics, you know, roughly an $8 billion company at the time with 50,000 employees. So, so clearly, um, the employees and everyone was quite interested in what they had to say. So those are kind of experiences that are tough to get prepared for, but you do enter some strange set of circumstances when you're at this stage of your career. So let me stop there and see where you'd like to go from there. Um, do you still remember what that room looked like when you walked in? I sure do. Yeah, I sure yeah. do. Well, I just, I just retired in March, um, so they brought back some clips, because they film most of the yeah. things. So I remember going downstairs. I gave it in the cafeteria. And, and um, fortunately, I was well equipped to do town hall meetings, be quick on my feet. And what I'll share with you is you know, what I shared with them, and I shared both with the board and I shared with um, shareholders and everyone I met with, is yes, I did have a perspective, but I needed to take some time to verify and validate that in fact what I thought was true, and I would come back in six months with the plan, which I eventually did, which was the fall, the fall of 2012. And what I and my team called it was our new quest, our new quest. And I used that as the platform to share with the shareholders of what we expected to accomplish with executing against that plan, but also, as importantly, our employees and also our, our customers of where we thought we would take the company. So that was the beginning of the march, if you will, of, of Steve as the CEO of Quest Diagnostics. Uh, so you met with those employees that first day. Um, you know the thing they want to hear is that they're going to still have a job and it's going to be their job. Um, I'm guessing you didn't maybe exactly say that, but what did you say? Yeah, well, I so said, first of all, you know, I'm going to ground myself in asking um, all the different stakeholders, customers and shareholders and, and, um, and employees what they thought we needed to change, what we needed to keep the same. But I also assured them there would be change, yeah. okay, and would change. Um, you know, in some cases, it would not be comfortable for people, but they understood that they, they would be part of that. It was interesting, uh, Dean, when I, when I talked about it, Fortunately for me, the organization was ready for change. As a matter of fact, the quote I always remember was, uh, Steve, we understand there's going to be change. Why don't you just rip the Band-Aid off? Let's get started, because we, we need the leadership. We need the change. But you also see recommendations of those early days of cultural changes that you never would expect. So one of the first things I did was to meet with my management team and ask, you know, what would you keep the same? What would you change? And to the person, they all said, Steve, you need to open up the top floor, which was the fourth floor of this office building in New Jersey. I was officed in. I said, what do you mean by open up the top floor? They said, all the doors are locked up here. We cannot get access, even as members of your staff, to the CEO suite. It was a very nice building. Uh, and we no longer have that building. We opened, a, we opened up a new facility, we opened open offices in a much more Spartan office complex than what we had at that point. I go, really? So I went outside and realized you had to have key access to get it to my little suite. And so I asked for my admin assistant to go get some wedges to put underneath the doors. 
and I unlocked all the, all the keypads to the front desk. Well, I can tell you, Dean, that spread like wildfire throughout the company, where we have this crazy guy in the CEO suite. He's unlocked all the doors. So that was a big change. So you don't really understand when you enter a job like that and in a situation like that, what might be viewed is yeah. small but very symbolic change. Yeah. You know? And changing culture. And Absolutely. I want to ask you in a minute about yeah. culture. But before that, you said you were going to come, or you did come back with a plan in six months with your team. Right. So how many members of that team are people you brought with you from Philips? Um, so, so when I came, let's just say, you know, there's a lot of things we needed to affect, and one was just a cost structure, okay? So we immediately had to take a hard look at spans and layers, you know, how many people reported to me, how many layers there were, and uh, we unfortunately had to take out 15% of management, okay, number one. So we took a lot of management, okay? We had to redesign the framework of how we managed the company. And then secondly is we, we, I had to look around the table and say, who's gonna be, who needs to be on my team? Mm -hmm. And so, Unfortunately, I changed out about 60 to 70 percent of the management team. Okay, and so at that point, um, I made some changes and I made it make it quick. So I brought in, you know, six to seven new people on the team. Um, I brought in one person um, from Philips uh, that I had brought into Philips, my supply chain operations person. And also one woman joined me that was from Phillips years ago, but she was working for a competitor, and she gave me a call and said, I'd love to join you on your management team. So, so most of the people from outside, from a variety of um, industries, but different backgrounds that I thought would be good in developing the new team. Yep. Um, so let's talk about culture then. Um, uh, I, uh, this brief story you um, already shared is one that could be seen as about creating a place that's more open and inclusive, uh, perhaps, and I, I know that mm -hmm. inclusivity matters to you in general, and mm -hmm. so maybe the question could just be a broad one. How, do you cre how did you think about creating um, culture and um, maybe creating a specific culture? That, you know, it's yeah. maybe not something as easy as a three bullet point plan. Right, right. Well, you know, culture takes decades to develop and form, and it, hap it happens over time. And the company already had a culture. I mean, I, I can't walk into a new environment to think it's gonna be my culture because I put something on a piece of, you know, piece of paper. So when we thought about the new vision for the company, I say we, I tried to bring in as many people as reasonable to quickly go through grounding ourselves in a new plan. We had some conversation about what do we need to change and how we act? You know, because what is culture? It's just how you get things done. How do you get things done in the, in the environment that you're in? And so we, we, we put together a short list of those you know, handful of things that we needed to start acting in a different way. Okay? And, and, and we talked about that, um, but more importantly than talk about it, uh, it was important for myself, but also my management team, to role model what we expected. Okay. So one of the things on the short list is becoming more externally oriented. I was, I was struck with how many conversations were internally oriented, not externally oriented. Very few customer conversations. So immediately I made time to spend a lot of time with customers, made time to spend time with the sales force and get more engaged with the management team and how we drive what we do in the marketplace. The second was um, there was a lot of activity but the activity wasn't necessarily attached to performance. And matter of fact, one of the issues that the company had was a concern about you know, the company not hitting its numbers consistently and having some performance issues. So we brought a little harder edge kind of performance orientation to the conversations around the table. Um, and so those are noticeable changes. So the effect culture, it takes years and it takes a lot of actions and it takes behaviors of leaders and it all starts at the top. So it really starts with me and then my management team. Um, relative to that um, desire for more of an external focus, also there's um, a, a phrase that you used about uh, the importance of, or the centrality of um, diagnostics for mm -hmm. um, healthcare, uh, mm -hmm. positive health, yeah? And um, I, I wonder if you could say a little bit more. That, that wasn't, 
a mantra? At, was that a mantra at the firm before you started, or is that something that you felt like was part of the focus that you wanted to bring, um, which which I think led to some spinning off of some other. Yeah, some exactly. Well, first of all, you know, the company had decided to diversify somewhat. Um, and when I looked at the company uh, from the outside and then when it came inside, it clearly had plenty of scope to be successful in, in some of the areas that we had invested in, felt like um, it was a distraction, okay? And so the strategy was to, was to say, well, where's healthcare, where's healthcare headed? And a large portion of healthcare decision-making is based upon the information we provide and therefore, yes, it's important that we run the world's largest laboratory, clinical laboratory, but it's more important that we take that content and we make it insightful for, for patients and for clinicians, doctors and nurses to make that important next choice in healthcare. You know, whether you're gonna stay on a, medic, um, a med, whether you're gonna go see a specialist, you cut back in 12 months is very much you know, determined based upon that laboratory value we had, and there's more and more insight you can combine from those values over time. So that was a change, to think about ourselves not being in the laboratory business, but being the diagnostic information services business, so it was important. And that action from insight, which became our tagline underneath our brand, because we refreshed our brand, was an important march for the entire company of where we made investments, and as part of that, we put together a five-point strategy that we launched in, in the fall of 2012. And one of those is to refocus on diagnostic information services. So we divested from some of these device businesses and services businesses we had bought that didn't fit in that scope. And I felt that scope was broad enough, it was ambitious enough, and content rich enough to really make a contribution and not be, be, be distracted with some businesses that are quite different. So that focus, um makes me think about what came along seven years later, which was the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And do you feel that focus helped or harmed? Quest was a very visible firm during the pandemic, right. and right. I'd like you, to, if you would, talk a little bit about sure. how you approached the role that your firm would right. play in the pandemic, and whether you think of that as a continuation of that focus or in some ways different from it. Yeah, well, um, well those are interesting times. Right, this is uh, 2012, uh, excuse me, uh, 2020, 2020. So we're keeping an eye on, um, uh, uh, on COVID at a distance. We knew it was in, in Asia and um, we understood in the early part of 2020, it was in the Northwest of the United States. And we have scientists that understand you know, what, what you know, the virus is, and we have developed quickly assays that could allow us to test for, the, for uh, COVID-19. But it wasn't until March of 2020, we're here in the United States, okay, we realized that this was real, right? And you know you have to step up, step up as a leader when, when um, all of a sudden, within literally a day or two, um, you're at a very different place in time. Okay, so I'll tell you a little bit about this, because um, it's always a fun story. So I was down in Washington. I just came back from a ski vacation. It was the first week of March. And I was down in Washington walking through a law firm where we have our trade association meetings. And the woman that runs our trade association came up to me and said, your admin assistant's trying to get a hold of you. Well, that's good. You know, what does Courtney want? Well, she says that she wants to get a hold of you because uh, the White House would like to talk to you. I said, oh, okay, that's interesting. I said, okay, I mean, it's probably not true. It's probably some of my college buddies pulling a crank, okay? <laughs> How often is the White House getting out of So I called my admin assistant on my cell phone uh, this, at this, uh, in this office building, and she said, yes, uh, Vice President Pence, um, uh, his office called, they would like you on a conference call. And so no sooner did she say that, I look at my phone and I see you know, Washington, D.C. go through and you know, four zeros at the end. She goes, pick up, it might, be, it might be them. So I literally pick up the call and pick up the phone and I said, hello, Steve Ruskowski. And on the other side is, hi, Steve, this is Vice President Pence. We're here at the White House. We've got the who's who of healthcare. We've got some colleagues from the industry and we need your help. So that's when it all started. And that was March 3rd of 2020. 
And so at the end of the call, and, and, and now these people you know from Dr. Fauci to um, uh, Azar, who is the Secretary of Health and Human Services, Vice President Pence, you know, the who's who of who's in the middle of the pandemic. At the end of the call, we all discuss what do we need to do because the objective is how are we going to bring up quickly testing throughout the United States, you know, given the complicated question that, that is. And I said, well, frankly, this is complicated stuff and we need to get together. And so Vice President Pence said, well, what do you think we should do, Steve? I said, well, we should get together and have a meeting. He goes, can you get to Washington? I said, unfortunately, I'm in Washington. So the next day, we're all at the White House having a, having a, conference, having a, call, having a um, discussion about bringing up COVID testing in the United States. And it was the who's who of healthcare throughout the United States. So you never know when there's going to be a call, okay, a call for leadership. And that's another example when you're sitting in the seat where you get a call. And, and then the question is, how do you step up and answer that call? Yeah. What was the hardest part of responding to that? Well, the hardest part of it is, you know, at the same time that COVID is starting to, you know, be spread throughout the world, um, we're starting to shut down the country. And a large part of my business is based upon physicians seeing patients. And if you recall those times, you know, physicians are, you know, start, start not, start, are starting to no longer see patients. And so my base business was turning off, okay? I mean, literally, we went from 100% down to 50% within three to four weeks. And so you're sitting there with 50,000 people, and you're, you're every other day doing financial models of how you're gonna make payroll. And at the same time, you're being asked for the com country with no commitments. I was gonna Absolutely ask, no did commitments. they promise you know, no, billions of no, dollars a, to no, you? To no, no, it was a leap of faith. You do it and it will come. Yeah. There was no CARES Act. There was no reimbursement commitment. There was nothing. There was just, this is the right thing to do. So we did the right thing. We began to you know, invest. Um, but at the same time, we needed to, in, in good consciousness, be able to plan for how would the company operate. And you know, we're a very you know, cash um, healthy company. But at that point, when you're, your volume is down to 50%, and you have a fixed cost infrastructure, you're worried about paying the bills. Yes. So we're immediately doing forecast after forecast, and we're trying to understand how much debt we need to take on, yes. all in parallel yes. when we're trying to bring up COVID testing throughout the country. Yes. So, so it was an unbelievable, stressful time that you're trying to you know, keep this in balance with what you're trying to invest in. Yes. Um, with a lot of uncertainty in front of us because we weren't sure how long the pandemic would last yes. and how long the downturn would last with people seeing physicians. Yeah. Um, was part of this about repurposing existing facilities that you had in order to kind of re retro? Well, to some extent. Some um, to some extent. So, you know, the portion of the laboratory that you use for doing COVID testing is called molecular testing. And so it's a small fortune of it. So we had to repurpose some of the equipment we'd use and some of the resources, but we clearly had to substantially change the size of all that. Yeah. But the interesting part of COVID, okay, COVID testing, it's not a blood draw, okay? So if you go to Quest Diagnostics, you go into one of our patient service centers, you can draw blood, it's blown by a phlebotomist. Well, we're not doing the nasal swabbing, right. okay? Yep. That uh, had to be done for that viral test, and so, there was, this is where it's complicated. It's not just about lighting up the lab. It's lighting up that front end as well. And the interesting part of the, the problem with COVID is those little swabs that we all know very well now, okay? About 60% of the, of the fiber that were used at the, end, at the tip of that, those swabs were sourced out of northern Italy. Now, you remember where COVID, one of the first areas that COVID first lit up was yes. northern Italy, yes. okay, outside of Milan, okay? So they were all shut down, and the world needed those little swabs. So we immediately need to think about how we're going to get more of those swabs. And then secondly is, you know, where are you going to do that swabbing? And initially, we were very concerned about protection, yes. okay? So you needed all the PPE, protect, uh, protective equipment. And then second, who would do it? And where you would do it. So part of the challenge was those physical locations we would do it. So part of the effort we, we spun up across the entire company or country was to start working with large retailers. 
And so we were on the phone with the CEOs of all the large retailers, uh, Doug McMillan, who runs you know, Walmart, uh, Walmart, you know, Fortune number one. He's on the phone with me trying to figure out how we're gonna do drive-throughs, and Larry Murillo runs CBS, and, and all the other drug stores that you could think of. We're trying to figure out how we're gonna be able to bring up those drive-throughs that you eventually saw. So that was part of the build-out. Yes. If how do you innovate to quickly get those, you know, get those, uh, you know, the swabs, they get those locations to do it. And then you needed medical people to do it. And those medical people had other jobs too. Uh, so we started working with um, the insurance companies and with the FDA to qualify. We did this in Seattle, we did it with the Mayo Clinic, to qualify that you and I could eventually do our own self-swabbing. Initially, it could not be done. The FDA did not approve us initially doing it. But eventually, we got en enough clinical evidence that demonstrated Yep. that you and I could do the swabbing, put it in the vial, send it to the lab, and that would be as good as a clinician doing that work as well. But there was a lot of innovation that it would quickly take place in a rapid period of time. Yeah, so it wasn't only responding with what you could do, but also planning for what you would be able to do six to 12 months out, maybe. Um, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, where, where'd that fabric come from then, that you, that you weren't able to get from Italy? Yeah, well, we second sourced it from some other firms, okay, in, in Asia. In okay, Asia. In okay. Asia, yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, we qualified some other fabrics that are used, um, you know, throughout healthcare yes. uh, for that, pur that yes. purpose. Yeah. Um, and then we brought back up the northern Italian operations as well uh, yeah. once they felt comfortable with doing that. Yeah. Um, but, um, you know, <laughs> everyone was looking for those, those, um, those swaps. Yeah, of course. Right. Yes. Yeah. So it's yeah. not just you. Yeah. Um, uh, those efforts um, made a huge difference across the country, um, and Steve also, they made a huge difference here in the Boston area. I just to I appreciate that. that. Yeah. Um, uh, so uh, you mentioned innovation, and maybe we could take, we will open up in just a few minutes to questions from the um, here and uh, folks online. <clears throat> um, this is MIT, and sure. maybe we talk a little bit about technology and these days some aspects of it like AI, and the way that um, the diagnostic needs sure. and challenges are changing. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so you know, in every part of healthcare and part of medicine, um, you know, technology and innovation has an enormous role. I mean, there was innovation um, in what I just described throughout the pandemic and, and um, you know, how we just think about that workflow. Because a, lar a large part of innovation is not always in the in the medicine, but sometimes in the workflow and the processes that you can automate. And, uh, and, and by doing that automation, it finds it much more helpful, okay, um, throughout the healthcare delivery system. But in the whole diagnostics field, and you think about AI, um, well, clearly, when you, when you think about what I said earlier, that it's the action from insight, and the whole notion of action from insight is there, there is some interesting content that if you can glean uh, the portion of that content to make a difference in healthcare, you, you have something that matters. And in our field, we have anatomic pathologists, doctors that are trained to look at specimens, um, primarily for cancer, okay? So we have 500 pathologists that literally look under a microscope and look for pattern recognition and make a call whether it's cancer or not, right? And you think about what they do, Clearly, there's a portion of that a computer, okay, um, could be very useful, okay. And so, digital pathology is coming. Um, artificial intelligence is part of that. And there's no question that that could transform that portion of healthcare, where the calls on whether it's cancer or not, the calls on what you do with, you know, the type of cancer will be improved with innovation. So, in that portion of diagnostics, it clearly has a place, but there's many more applications for innovation, and there's many more opportunities for innovation throughout healthcare. Um, um, does it relate in some way to, um, you know, people used to talk about customized medicine, and mm -hmm. um, I wonder if technology and AI might play a role in uh, moving that a bit forward as well? Sure. If, so um, not the yes, no about cancer, but the, the specifics yeah, of yeah, yeah. what well, to do for yeah, you. Well, absolutely, and sometimes you know, it's referred to as precision medicine, mm -hmm. okay? 
And in precision medicine, where you can actually determine based upon the specific case and, and uh, in that person, first of all, whether there is a disease that one should be treated, and secondly, is what do you treat it with? Okay, and many pharmaceutical comp uh, pharmaceuticals are now being developed with the need for what's described as a companion diagnostic. So the diagnostic is part of that medical labeling with a pharmaceutical, and it will determine whether, first of all, it will work, and what's the proper dose, and then how do you monitor over time. So it's all coming, so it's a system that you're, yes. you're now administering to the patient, no longer just the drug and it's trial and error with the drug, whether it works or not, now you can determine it is gonna work based upon the test. Um, uh, so maybe as one last um, question for now, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, inviting you to think about what your questions or comments might be. Um, but you um, uh, finished this chair in March. Mm -hmm. um, how do you think about a transition away from the role of president, CEO, and chair? And yeah. how do you think about your time now and looking ahead? Yeah, well, it's a, Oh, it's a great chapter. Uh, we're you know, fortunate to have had a fabulous career um, in many ways. Um, I'll be celebrating my 40th anniversary from graduating from Sloan School in 1984. Yes. It's hard to believe. Yes. Um, so 40 years. Um, and you know what I did, I, you know, I'm very thankful for having an opportunity to do it. Uh, but it is nice to be able to eventually at the same point say I made a contribution, time for change. And so in March of this year, I officially retired from the board and I'm thinking about what the next chapter will be. Well, I could tell you one of the first things on my list is to do the things I haven't been able to do for 45 years. <laughs> you know, I have plenty of, plenty of hobbies. I, I like to golf, I love to ski, I love to fish. We have a boat, we have a sailboat, we have four grandkids, I have two children, both of which graduated from the Sloan School. Yeah, yeah, both, yeah, so we have three Sloan School yeah. grads, yeah. My daughter graduated in 2011 and my son in 2014. Both uh, work and in, in live in the Boston area, so they're doing well. So, so there's you know, a big long bucket list. Uh, of things I want to do. So I want to make sure I protect that. At the same time, it would be a shame not to take advantage of me, utilize all of the experience I have had and, and still stay active. And so I joined uh, three public boards and one private board. Um, and then I do some new venture advising, if you will. And I'm trying to gauge that in a way, Dean, to not do too much, so I'm being careful um, where I still have that balance, because the bias right now is on my personal side of life and less on the professional. But at the same time, I think it'd be unfortunate for me not to take advantage of what I've learned and apply it and still make a contribution professionally. So, so far, so good. Yeah. yeah. Is there any serious prospect in your mind that you'd take operating responsibilities again or not so much? No. no. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, it is so nice. It's not so to, fun, though. <laughs> it's great. And, and I tell you, you know, it's, um, it's, it's great when you're in the seat, okay? And it's, you know, as this, my last job was the best job I ever had. There's no question. For 12 years running a company, it's the best job you ever had. But it comes with a price, okay? Every day you're worried about 50,000 people. Every day you've got to worry, you know, about something. And you know, every month you're worried about hitting your numbers, every quarter you're hitting, you know, hitting your analyst expectations. It's pretty intense, you know, it's pretty intense. And to step away from that and you know, go to bed on Sunday night and not worry about what do I gotta do first thing I, when my feet hit the ground on Monday morning is a good thing. So I, um, I'm enjoying that part and getting a break from it. I love it, yeah. thank you, yes. Um, might anyone have a question or a comment for Stephen? We have microphones, and I hope we have some brave souls who would um, be willing to speak up. There's one here, get started. Yes. Extra participation points right here. This is really <laughs> excellent. Thank you. Thanks so much for coming. My name is Cameron. I'm a first year MBA at Sloan. Um, and 
hopefully anticipating 40 years of a career. Sure. Um, how did you leverage and work with people that you met and knew from Sloan um, as mentors, as guides, as friends uh, over those 40 years? And did it change as you took different roles or went between firms? Yeah, yeah, good question. Well, I tell you, um, you know, as I mentioned, I graduated in 84. And uh, when, I, when I came to MIT, and I guess it was 82 when I joined, I came to school. It's a very different place than what you guys have. Uh, I thought I was walking through the lobby in that small little lobby that now has like three chairs and it was the lobby, right? So, um, but still in, in the 80s, um, you know, those, that, the time I spent here, it was a special time, okay? And I would just encourage you, your first year in the, in the fall, I can remember that first year, um, just kind of taking it all in. And so just, just uh, give you advice, take advantage of it, you know, take advantage of it. And so what, you ta what did you take in? I'll get back to my classmates. Well, what you find here, and it is a unique culture, I think the Sloan School has a culture, but the university has a culture. And I think you know the university adds to the Sloan School and vice versa, the yeah. culture. But the interesting part of this place now is the environment around here in Kendall Square. Okay? When I was here, you had the tea stop, okay? you know, the Kendall tea stop. The Marriott wasn't there. All that that's now in back of the Marriott wasn't here. It was parking lots. There was nothing but parking lots. And okay? you know, we had the F&T Deli. Okay, and we, you know, the coop or whatever it's called now, you know, the bookstore was in there, so all those were vacant. But now you have this unbelievable vibe. And the Money Charles, these are two. The, the Money Charles, yes, I was one of my, one of my accomplishments, I was a, bud, a, um, a bartender at the Money Charles pub. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and I, you laugh, but that's a little bit of what I'm saying. The environment, because I learned right. as a bartender at the Money Charles pub, because you know you get this eclectic group of people that come into the Muddy Charles Pub. It's a graduate student's pub, right? And you learn a lot. And so I, what I found is this unbelievable um, intellectual curiosity here. You know, there's intellectual curiosity. And then secondly is the innovation you touched about. You know, the, the, the school's all about innovation. So how do you take the intellectual curiosity of trying to say what needs to be done and apply what can be done, right? And, and then the intensity of it all. It's an intense place. But it's also, you know, it's a collegial, you know, teamwork environment that's different than other places. And, and then finally is the international element, yeah. um, which is just coming through as you walk the campus, right? So that, to me, really affected me, and it stayed with me for 40 years, right? And then through my classmates, whether it be working together at the Monty Charles Pub, working out in the gym, working out on projects. You know, we learned a lot from each other, and some of those relationships carried on. Um, with just you know, talking to people over the phone or connecting with people through your travels of your career. Um, and I just, you know, I, uh, I utilized that one appropriate as you kind of walk through it. I tell you, my, my two children, who are far from children, my daughter's 39 and my son's 36. I think their connection with their classmates was better than mine. One, because their class size was much bigger than mine. And secondly, is there's much more in your curriculum now that's much more around teamwork yeah. and less academic classroom work. Um, when I was here, there was a lot of academic classroom work. I mean, if you remember those days, it was really, really intense and really rigorous. Do you guys have any academic classroom work? <laughs> I, I'm not sure if we're still doing that. But I think it has okay. changed. Right? Yeah. It has changed. It has changed. Uh, so anyways, that's, you know, the, uh, take advantage of everything you have here. Don't miss it. And then form those relationships, and who knows where those relationships would be, because it is a special place. And absorb it all, and then utilize it afterwards. Can, can I just add, Steve, that uh, yeah. so, and you never know what's going to happen to some of the classmates that you have. We were talking about one of them. We sure. don't need to mention him by name, yeah. but who is the head of one of the leading um, banks in Southeast Asia. Exactly. And, you know, I mean, just to have that network around the world and to build the bridges. Yeah, absolutely. Through, uh, absolutely. You know, this Thai guy who was absolutely. a classmate. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yes. Yeah. 
Yeah. Chemical engineer turned banker, right? Yes, so. all of that. Hi, thank you so much. That was wonderful, really interesting and very touching. My name's Captain Alexandra Haggerty. I was the first female hospital ship captain with Mercy Ships. Oh, well. And uh, your COVID story really touched me a lot because we had 450 people, 60 nationalities, and trying to get over to Africa and do these life-changing surgeries was a huge deal. And now I'm an executive I'm in the executive MBA program mm -hmm. and I'm meeting people from all over the world. It's absolutely fascinating. And one thing I would like to know is what do you think makes a great chairman? How do you become a part of a board of directors and where do you see that going? What, what insight do you have sure. and share with the group? Sure. Sure. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for that. And actually there's a connection here with you. I served on the board of a nonprofit called Project Hope. And it, it, it was actually, um, it was founded in 1958 with a doctor by the name of Bill Walsh, and he knew President Eisenhower. And he said, President Eisenhower, we could we would benefit America if you gave me one of your naval ships, and I'll call it the US Hope, and I'll bring Western medicine to emerging markets. And in those years, it was primarily China. And so I was fortunate enough to serve on that board, and, and what we did is what you do. Um, you know, we, we had Hopis, which volunteer, and my, my wife is actually a critical nurse by training, so she served on the USS Hope, after, not Hope, but it was the Mercy from the Navy, and, 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 and after the, the um, earthquake in Haiti. So um, I was fortunate, I just left that board, and I was given a piece of the rail, the original USS Hope, so a special part of being in healthcare. So you asked me about transitioning the boards and chairmanship. Um, well, chairmanship role, uh, as you see, I had three titles. You know, I get one salary, but three titles, right? Because um, it, it's actually in U.S. companies now, and I serve on a Dutch board right now, and Dutch and German governance is, is somewhat different. And I'll share a little bit about that. The Dutch and the German governance structure says, well, there's really a difference between independent board members, okay, which is called a supervisory board, and the board of management. And when I was at, at Phillips, I was part of the board of management, with five people that ran the company, and then there's a supervisory board that has oversight, independent board oversight. In the United States, um, we're thinking about the role of management, people that run the company, okay, and the board, okay? And, and this has evolved over time, and I would say 15, 20 years ago, the majority of CEOs were also their executive chair of the board. Okay? Now, if you look at any of the data, it's roughly 50-50. 50 percent okay? of U.S. boards um, will have a separation of the roles of the CEO and will have an independent, non-executive chair of the board. Okay? And, and the reason for that is to make sure there's good oversight, making sure that the board is, is holding members of management accountable, uh, for performance of the company. Um, and then if you don't have a, a chair, uh, an independent chair, there'll be a lead director that fulfills that role, okay? So it's evolving. And you know, what makes a good chairperson is relationship with the independent board members. Now, whether it was called chairman or my oversight responsible board member who was a lead director, it really doesn't matter. The board that you're working with has to keep you um, um, your feet to the fire in terms of management of the company and has to make sure the necessary oversight is put in place of management to make that all happen. And so in my role as the chairman and CEO, we're both operating responsibility, it was really important for me to preside over the board and agree on the, you know, the agenda for the board, but work hand in hand with my lead director to make sure we represented shareholders well. Because they had the call, okay? They had the call on the company. So the most important thing for the board, the independent board members, is to decide on the CEO. So much you know, joked um, about you know, the board at Sloan. In a publicly traded company, I work for the board because they represent shareholders. And so the most important thing they do is hire and fire the CEO. And that's the mo most important that thing you should do as a board member is to make sure you have the right strategy and make, make sure that you have the right management team to execute that strategy 
and you, you deliver value for shareholders. And if you don't, you're going to get a lot of help. Hmm. You're getting a lot of help. So hopefully that answers the question. Yeah. Yep. Uh, so Steve, we have another question. Uh, we have actually two here. So uh, I, we'll, uh, we'll hopefully be able to work both of them. Sure, out. no problem. <laughs> We're just excited. Um, so my name is Reshma Patel. I'm in the Executive MBA program as well. Um, I'm at Elevance Health in the digital health space. Um, two things that kind of stuck out to me is how do you make those decisions around your competitive advantage strategy and decide what's a distraction versus what's building onto your core competencies? Mm -hmm. and but continuing to move the needle um, and innovating. So that's one that's one question that's always burning in my mind, especially in the digital health space at a large fortune company like Elevance Health. Um, the second one is as a mid-career executive, I'm trying to figure out the balance of being a jack of all trades, master of none, because I do have large aspirations, but I want to make sure I'm being strategic sure. about yeah, both. Yeah, absolutely. Well, let me start with the second um, first. So when I joined Quest, launched a new strategy, realized that we needed to build some capabilities in the management team. As part of building up those capabilities, I created a one-week um, leadership development program. Okay? And I would kick it off and I would end it. Right? And so my kickoff I would have a conversation, first I'd chat like this about, you know, what do I think about what I've learned over the last 40 years? And as far as career, what I'll share with you is what I share with them, is I think it's important that you have some direction. Okay, when I left the Sloan School, as a matter of fact, my picture was in the Sloan School book back then in 1984, and I read what I said, and I said I wanted to run, a, I would like to run a business someday. Be prepared to run a business today. Now that could take different sizes and shapes. You know, a publicly traded company or running a division in a company, that's what I wanted to do. So I did have direction. But if you were to ask me in 1984, would I be sitting in front of you having the 40 years of experience? I would never would have ever expected. So you have to have direction. And I would say, frame the picture, but don't think you're gonna fill out exactly what that picture looks like. You know, it's all fidelity. So have some direction, and you're gonna learn a lot over your career, and you're gonna build those skills. You know, the skills I have today are, are quite different than what I started 40 years ago, so that will come, but have some direction, whatever that direction might be. The second part is how do you make those choices? Um, well, you need, to, you need to digest a lot of information quickly. Um, you're gonna have a lot of advice from a lot of people, um, and you're gonna look at all the analytics, you can look at all the data, and you can get lost in all the data, okay? And that's why it's helpful to have some experience in the field that you're making decisions in, because at the end of the day, you gotta make a call, and a lot of those calls are based upon your instincts, okay? And the good things about instincts is nobody could ever really know if you made a bad decision or not. <laughs> I mean, because you usually, you know, you, you make a decision, you move forward with that decision. Who knows what left or right was the right decision? You made the right decision, you go forward with it. Um, but generally, you know, if you make the right decision, you're gonna, you know, you're gonna see it in your results. Uh, but I would just say, trust your instincts, okay? Yeah, you need to have all the analytics, and yeah, you need to have that good management discipline, discipline but at the end of the day, you know, your experience and all that, you know, wisdom you develop over the years is so helpful. Uh, so final question, lightning round, if we may, yes. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm Margaret Yuan. I'm also a classmate of Alexandra and uh, Reshma. We're all in the AMBA program. We talked a lot about power dynamics, um, executives, how do we change or how do we make an innovation or change when the corporation that we work in are resistant to change. So yeah. you mentioned that you walked into sure. it. And in your case, Steve, um, they were open to change. But in my role as a director in a public uh, Fortune 500 mm -hmm. international company, people are, not, people are often very resistant to change because it makes them feel threatened. They don't yeah. know what's coming. Sure. They're worrying about being replaced by AI, yeah. da, 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 da. We've heard sure. it all. Love to hear some of how would you solve or attack this problem in today's corporation? And secondly, very curious to know, how did you balance that ROI serving the board to doing the right thing when to do the COVID testing as well as having to pay the payroll? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So first of all, um, 
yes, when I spoke to some people, they were, they were ready for change, but you know, change is not gonna come in a quarter, it's not gonna come in a year, it's gonna be a multi-year effort, it's gonna be a march, okay? And so people say that, but then when we got into the change, it was more difficult than they expected. And then, you know, some people didn't realize there might be first, you know, personal consequences with that change. So it was easy for me at the beginning, I was saying this is what we're gonna do, and let's you know, get behind it. And then as we got into it, you start to realize this is gonna be more difficult. And so in year two and three, I actually ran exercises within the company to pick people throughout the company and actually interview people to say, how is the change going? And there was a professor who used to be at Harvard Business School that helped me through this, Mike Beers, I don't know if you ran in Mike. He has this methodology called the fishbowl, okay? And management gets in the fishbowl and members of the management team talk about what's not going well, okay? And you talk through it. And you realize that yes, this is where we wanna go. And yes, we have an execution plan. But there's some things with execution that need to be tuned up and there's questions and the concerns. So you need to bring people along with you on that journey. But I'll just end with, when, you know, year two or year three, we'd have an annual leadership meeting. And, you know, I'd stand in front of the group. I said, I, you know, I told you that we're going to go through change. And I told you, you know, the change is going to lead to a good result, but it's going to take some time. And rest assured, I'm not leaving. <laughs> no, but part of it is, you know, some people are sitting by the wayside. I say, well, this guy's going to be gone in three years. And, you know, there'll be somebody else that comes right. in with another plan. Well, in my case, I said, no, I'm committed to making the change. We're going to be, and whether you want it or not, I'm, I'm going to be here next year, okay? And so, so the, you know, the steadfast commitment to what you're trying to build and the commitment that you're going to work through those rough patches and deal with, you know, those bumps in the road to eventually make progress and then show progress because you need to show progress so that people begin to believe. Okay. Steve, thank you so much. Thank you. I know some people got class coming up. Thanks for engagement in the room and online. Steve, thank you for being thank you so open for and me. insightful. Thank much appreciated. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.